Hello and good afternoon. I'm Mohana Priya. Welcome to Updates at Noon. Yang di Pertuan Agung Al Sultan Abdullah Ria Yatuddin Al Mustafa Billah Shah and Raja Permaisuri Agung Tunku Aziza Amina Maimuna Iskandaria expressed their hopes for peace, prosperity, unity and jubilation among those celebrating Christmas. In a statement, Istana Negara's Comptroller of the Royal Household, Dato Ahmad Fadil Samsudin and Al said Al Sultan Abdullah and Tunku Aziza also hoped that the people would not be dejected by the year's somber mood following the the COVID-19 pandemic. Their Majesties also reminded the people who celebrate the festive occasion to remain cautious and disciplined in looking after their safety and health by complying with the SOP implemented by the government and health authorities. Their Majesties also take the opportunity to wish the people a happy new year in conjunction with the coming 2021 new year. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Tan Sri Mohidin Yassin has called on Malaysians to turn the community's racial and religious diversity into strength to further build the country in the spirit of Christmas amid the new normal. With the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the Premier said this year's Christmas celebration would not be as merry as before, especially the house-to-house -house visits by family members and friends would be limited, while open house would be held in moderation. The Federal Territories Ministry will develop 10,000 affordable housing units for youth at a price of 200,000 ringgit per unit under the Residency Prihatin program. Its Minister Tan Sri Anwar Musa explained that this is the first round of the program where 1,000 units will be built in Labuan, 3,000 units in Putrajaya and 6,000 units in Kuala Lumpur. Peringkat pertama ni kita harap dapat kita memulakan pembinaan sebanyak kira-kira 10,000 unit dan 3,000 di Putrajaya. Kita harap dapat membina kira-kira 1,000 di Labuan ya. dan yang sebaiknya lagi itu sekitar 5 ke 6,000 di, di Kuala Lumpur sendiri untuk pusing yang pertama. Tan Sri Anwar Musa said the construction will begin in the second quarter of 2021 and expected to be completed in 24 or 36 months. He also said the paperwork had been presented to and agreed by the cabinet. The minister also said five projects under the Malaysian Civil Servants Housing Program in Putrajaya that were cancelled previously would also be continued under the Residency Prihatin Program. The Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industries will conduct a stricter inspection on imported meat products. Its Deputy Minister, Dato Sri Ahmad Hamza, said this is to ensure that the meat products entering Malaysia are safe and its halal certifications are recognised by Malaysian authorities. Bila ia dimasukkan dalam negara, ia melalui beberapa uh, pemeriksaan dan juga dan melibatkan bukan sahaja daripada custom bahkan makis iaitu agensi pemeriksaan dan kuarantin di bawah di bawah Kementerian Pertanian dan Industri Makanan Datuk Sri Ahmad Hamzah said that investigations are still being conducted to identify the mastermind of the meat cartel smuggling syndicate. Early this month, the Malaysian Quarantine and Inspection Services had uncovered a syndicate responsible for smuggling non-certified meat into Malaysia with fake halal logo in Johor. The government is planning to extend the wage subsidy program PSU for another three months, which is expected to benefit 160,000 employers and 1 million workers. Deputy Human Resources Minister Awang Hashim said the extension of the program is targeted for workers in tourism and retail sector that earn 4,000 ringgit and below. Kerajaan telah menyediakan uh, satu dana yang amat besar untuk uh, PSU ini atau program subsidi upah ini iaitu sebanyak 18 bilion ringgit untuk memelihara kesejahteraan serta kelangsungan hidup pekerja dan majikan melalui uh, PSU ini. Dengan adanya usaha ini, kerajaan telah berjaya menyelamatkan hampir 2.72 juta pekerja dan 330,000 majikan.
Previously, on 23rd December, Finance Minister Tengku Dato Sri Zafrul Abdul Aziz said 239.73 million ringgit had been channeled to 39,203 employers to continue their operations and retain a total of 307,420 employees under the PSU 2.0. Beginning 1st January, employers who fail to send their foreign workers for COVID-19 tests will be penalised under the Prevention and Control of Infectious Diseases Act 1988, also known as Act 342. Senior Minister for Security, Dato Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakov, said the decision was made after the Human Resources Ministry had established that there was still a large number of employers who failed to adhere to the directive. Elaborating further on the matter, Dato Sri Ismail Sabri said that since 1st December, the government has ordered all foreign workers in all industries, including the construction, factory and commercial sectors, to be tested for COVID-19. KSM memaklumkan, Kementerian Sumber Manusia memaklumkan, masih terdapat ramai majikan yang enggan memberikan kerjasama untuk mematuhi arahan ini. Sehubungan dengan itu, sidang khas malam bersetuju untuk menguatkuasakan arahan ini bermula 1 Januari 2021 di bawah Akta 342 di mana majikan yang gagal mematuhi arahan ini akan dikenakan tindakan undang-undang dan penalti. As Malaysia breached 100,000 cumulative COVID-19 cases on Christmas Eve, four new COVID-19 clusters were reported yesterday in Kuala Lumpur and Selangor. In a statement released by the Health Ministry, the clusters have been identified as Kebun Baru Cluster, Sungai Burung Cluster, Tapak Bina Jalan Tun Cluster and Jalan Pandan Cluster. The Sungai Burung cluster was detected in Kuala Selangor district and the index case for the cluster was reported positive for COVID-19 on 19th December. 167 individuals have been screened and 28 cases have been identified as COVID-19 positive. For the Kebun Baru cluster in Kuala Langa district, the index case tested positive for the virus on 24th December following a targeted screening at a factory. 580 individuals have been screened with 95 individuals revealed to be positive for COVID-19. The third cluster, the Tapa Bina Jalan Tun cluster in Lembah Pantai, have registered 27 positive COVID-19 cases so far. The Jalan Pandan cluster was discovered in Lembah Pantai District, Cheras, Kepong and Titiwangsa in Kuala Lumpur and Komba, Petaling, Kuala Selangor and Hulurangat districts in Selangor with a total of 30 individuals testing positive for the virus. The Health Ministry also announced six clusters had ended yesterday, leaving 206 active clusters in the country. As for the Christmas celebration, Tan Sri Dr. Noor Hisham also reminded Malaysians to comply with the SOP and the continual practice of new norms such as social distancing among their family members. He also encouraged Malaysians to make use of video conferencing to substitute house visitations so as to protect the elderly and those vulnerable from the virus. Blood plasma from recovered COVID-19 patients have the potential to be used as treatment for future patients. According to blood transfusion specialist of Sultana Nur Zahira Hospital, Dr. Muhammad Mohaimin Kambali, currently several studies are being conducted not only in Malaysia but also other countries to ensure its efficacy and safety. Dr. Mohamed Muhaimin said the blood transfusion process will be conducted through a pharesis method in which the blood of a donor passed through a special apparatus that separates out one particular constituent and returns the remainder to the circulation. Kita akan hubungi pesakit-pesakit COVID yang bersesuaian dan kita akan panggil dan buat penerangan lebih lanjut. Antara kriteria dia, Dr. Antara kriteria dia dah sembuh pesakit, penyakit, penyakit COVID tersebut. Lepas tu kita akan uji dia punya antibody. Lah. Kita akan pastikan ada antibody dalam darah dia. Dan selain daripada itu, kelayakan asas penderma darah. Seperti dari segi berat badan, penyakit-penyakit lain, ubat-ubatan dan sebagainya. Currently, three recovered COVID-19 patients in Terengganu had been identified to donate their blood plasma.
American nurse that receives the vaccine as Christmas gift. That and more coming up in our foreign segment. Stay with us. Kami berbangga untuk berjasa, berdiri gagah untuk negara terus menerajui bersama anak bangsa yang tabah berusaha menyingkap lembaran baru dengan inovasi dan azam digenggam buat seluruh warganya. Inilah cara Malaysia mencapai kegemilangan. Bersama kita terus menerajui. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson hailed what he called the biggest trade deal yet with the European Union, saying Britain had taken back control of its laws, borders and fishing waters. Now, Britain clinched the narrow Brexit trade deal with the EU just seven days before it exits one of the world's biggest trading blocks in its most significant global shift since the loss of the empire. The deal means it has swerved away from a chaotic finale to a torturous divorce that has shaken the 70-year project to forge European unity from the ruins of World War II. Meanwhile, European leaders have generally welcomed the deal, agreed on Thursday between Britain and the EU over Brexit. The deal agreed more than four years after Britain voted narrowly to leave the bloc means it has averted a chaotic finale to the torturous divorce that has shaken the 70-year project to forge European unity from the ruins of World War II. It will preserve Britain's zero tariff and zero quota access to the bloc's single market of 450 million consumers, but will not prevent economic pain and disruption for the United Kingdom or for EU member states. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen said in a tweet it was a deal worth fighting for, while the EU's chief negotiator Michael Barnier said the clock is no longer ticking and looked forward to building a new partnership with the UK. French President Emmanuel Macron said the unity and strength of Europe paid off in the end, adding that the agreement with the UK was essential to protect European citizens, fishermen and producers. The UK formally left to the EU on 31st January, but has since been in a transition period under which rules on trade, travel and business remained unchanged until the end of this year. Pope Francis celebrated a low-key Christmas Eve mass made somber by the coronavirus pandemic and said people should feel obliged to help the needy because Jesus himself was born a poor outcast. The mass was held in a rare section of St. Peter's Basilica with fewer than 100 participants and only a small number of cardinals and bishops. It is usually held on the main section of the Basilica and attended by up to 10,000 people, including the diplomatic corps representing nearly 200 countries. Everyone except the Pope and the small choir wore a mask during the Mass, which began two hours earlier than usual so that even the limited number of people who attended could return home by a 10 p.m. curfew. The Pope said Christmas should make everyone reflect on our injustice towards so many of our brothers and sisters instead of pursuing our endless desire for possessions and ephemeral pleasures. Italians are under a nationwide lockdown for much of Christmas and New Year holidays. The restrictions mean people will not be able to go to St. Peter's Square or the Basilica and all papal events between 24th December and 6th January are taking place indoors with little or no public participation and being live streamed on the internet and broadcast on television. Mexico began inoculating its residents against COVID-19 as the government presided over the administering of a shot of Pfizer's coronavirus vaccine to a 59-year-old nurse in Mexico City in a ceremony broadcast on national media. Specialists at the intensive care unit of Mexico City's Ruben Linero Hospital, Maria Irene Ramirez, said the vaccine was the best gift she could have received in 2020. Es un poco nerviosa, pero además, este, pues muy feliz. La verdad es que es el mejor regalo que pude haber recibido en el 2020. Y esto, pues, me da pauta nada más para seguir con ahora con más seguridad y con más bríos para seguir al frente de esta guerra de un enemigo invisible. 
Meanwhile, Mexico's Deputy Health Minister Hugo lopez Catel said despite receiving their first batch of COVID-19 vaccine, they will keep up with protective measures for several months. He added that Pfizer is the first COVID-19 vaccine to reach Mexico, which has also signaled deals for vaccine from other firms. The first shipment arrived on Wednesday and only contained 3,000 doses of the vaccine. The next one will contain 50,000, with Mexico slated to receive 1.4 million units of the two-shot Pfizer vaccine by 31st January. Still on the COVID-19 vaccine, other Latin American countries, including Costa Rica and Chile, received their first batches of Pfizer vaccines as they begin inoculation yesterday. The vaccine shots are due to be given first to workers at healthcare centres and elderly care facilities before wider distribution. Health Minister Daniel Salas said the shipment contained 9,750 doses for the small Central American country and another delivery next week is expected to bring another 10,725 doses. Costa Rica, with a population of some 5 million, has registered more than 2,000 deaths due to the coronavirus and 161,942 infections. Over in Chile, the first 10,000 doses of a 10 million order of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine reached Santiago from Pfizer's manufacturing hub, the town of Purs in Belgium. The consignment consisted of two small boxes, each packed with 23 kilograms of dry ice to keep them at the ultra-cold temperatures required and 13 kilograms of vaccine-loaded syringes. The boxes were transferred by police helicopter to a logistics centre in the capital of Santiago with vaccinations soon following. President Sebastián Piñera said it was a happy moment after a rough year in Chile, which has been hit by intense, sometimes violent, anti-government protests that began in October 2019, then the coronavirus outbreak in March and its associated economic fallout. Piñera said the vaccine was free and voluntary and approved by both local and international health regulators. As we look back on 2020, we remember a year dominated by a staggering loss of life across the world. Let's take a look at the major events that happened from April to June this year in the 2020 Flashpoint. In the UK, British monarch Queen Elizabeth II made a rare address to the nation for only the fifth time in her 66 year as the number of global infection rose to over 1 million. And on the same day, British Premier Boris Johnson was admitted to hospital suffering from COVID-19. On the 6th of April, Japanese PM Shinzo Abe announced a state of emergency in seven prefectures and a nearly $1 trillion of stimulus package as coronavirus cases climbed in the region. Meanwhile, back in China, officials in Wuhan lifted the city-wide lockdown after 76 days, allowing over 11 million residents to continue their lives as usual under the new norm. Across the Yellow Sea, South Korea became the first country in the world to hold a general election under tight restriction due to COVID-19. President Moon Jae-in's ruling Democratic Party won an absolute majority in parliamentary elections, a landslide victory propelled by successes in the country's efforts to contain the new coronavirus. On April 18th, a gunman identified as Gabriel Watman committed multiple shootings and set fires at 16 locations in the Canadian Indian province of Nova Scotia, killing 22 people and injuring three others before he was shot and killed by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Enfield. Towards the end of the month, the price of US oil turned negative for the first time in history. West Texas Intermediate, the benchmark for US oil, plunged as low as minus $37.63 a barrel as worldwide demand fell. In May, after weeks of intense speculation about the health of Kim Jong-un, North Korea's state-run television KRT aired a video of the leader attending the completion of a fertilizer plant north of Pyongyang. This was the first report of his appearance since 11th April. 
Meanwhile, world leaders and organizations pledged $8 billion to fund research, manufacture and distribution of a possible vaccine and treatments for COVID-19. But the United States and Russia refused to contribute to the global effort. On 25th May, video of African-American George Floyd's arrest and murder while restrained in Minneapolis police custody showed he was pinned to the ground by police officer Derek Chauvin's knee for 8 minutes and 46 seconds, ignites widespread condemnation and nationwide protests. Protesters breached and set on fire a police precinct in Minneapolis as peaceful rallies gave way to nights of arson, looting and vandalism, with protesters venting their rage over Floyd's death. SpaceX, the private rocket company of billionaire entrepreneur Elon Musk, launched two Americans towards orbit from Florida on 30th May in a mission that marks the first spaceflight of NASA astronauts from U.S. soil in nine years. On 3rd of June, fired Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin, who kneeled on George Floyd's neck, will face a more serious murder charge. And three other sacked officers will be charged as aiding and abetting in Floyd's death. This came after independent autopsy found Floyd died of asphyxiation, thus ruling it homicide. On 21st June, Saudi Arabia bans international visitors from making the Islamic Hajj pilgrimage in 2020 due to the coronavirus outbreak. The kingdom said the suspension was provisional, but with the Umrah attracting millions of people annually, the decision has a huge potential impact. Meanwhile, the global death toll from COVID-19 passes 500,000, doubling in less than two months. Sports autopsy found no narcotics, no alcohol in Maradona's blood. We begin with the local front. The Negri Sembilan FC and SFC team under the guidance of new head coach Kate Davon will be comprised of 85% new players to face the Premier League next season. Davon, who confirmed the matter, said most of them are experienced Negri Sembilan born players who had played with several other teams in the Super League and Premier League this season. Currently, Davon said NSFC already have 16 to 17 local players and have confirmed one imported player with three more players being identified. The Bahau Jumpol Bond coach said that to strengthen the NSFC team in facing the league competition, he had the service of a 27-year-old midfielder from South Korea, Bay Boy Gum, who is currently playing with the team in Slovakia. Commenting on rumours that Kedah team striker Mohamed Zakwan Adha Abdul Raza would return to don the Hobin Jung Hobin squad jersey. Davon said the national player had expressed interest to be with Negri Sibilan. NSFC, prior to this, had recruited several new players, including Selangor 2 defender Raja Imran Shah Raja Amin, three former PJ City FC players, namely brothers R. Bharat Kumar and R. Aaron and Damien Lim. Also grabbed by NSFC were three former Malacca United FC, Saiful Ridzwan Slamat, Anas Arrahmat and Muhammad Feris Daniel Matnasir. An autopsy conducted on Argentine soccer star Diego Maradona revealed he did not consume alcohol nor illicit narcotics in the days before his death. The autopsy, which was based on blood and urine samples and released by the Buenos Aires Scientific Police, said Maradona had problems with his kidneys, heart and lungs. A judicial official told the media that Maradona, who died in November aged 60, had taken seven different medicines to treat depression, anxiety and other ailments, but there was no presence of illegal drugs. Investigators were looking into various facets of his death that rocked Argentina and the wider footballing world and have not ruled out wrongful death. 
The more detailed autopsy confirmed the results of one carried out immediately after his death that said that the former Boca Juniors and Napoli player died from acute pulmonary edema, secondary to exacerbated chronic heart failure with dilated cardiomyopathy. The charismatic 1986 World Cup winner, who was regarded as one of the greatest soccer players of all time, had battled alcohol and drug addiction for much of his life. A judge last week ruled that Maradona's body cannot be exhumed or cremated in case DNA is needed at a later date for use in paternity or other cases. Maradona has five recognized children and six with affiliation requests and they are part of a complex inheritance process underway in Argentina. Various media have reported that Paris Saint-Germain have fired their coach Thomas Tuchel with former Tottenham boss Maurizio Pochettino lined up as his replacement. So far, the French champions declined to make any comment when contacted to confirm the reports carried by L'Equip newspaper and RMC and German tabloid Bild. The 47-year-old German arrived at the Parc de Prance on a two-year contract in 2018 and guided PSG to their first ever Champions League final last season. But now, if the reports are confirmed, less than three months on from that final against Bayern Munich in Lisbon, Tuchel has become the first PSG coach to leave mid-season since Antoine Combari was replaced by Carlo Ancelotti in December 2011. Pochettino left Tottenham in November 2016, six months after leading them into their first Champions League final. This season, Tuchel has led PSG to a last 16 date with Barcelona in the Champions League, while on the domestic front, the Qatari backside are one point off the top of the table in League One. And that concludes today's updates at noon. In our top story today, wage subsidy program extension to benefit 1 million workers. Tune in to News at 10 tonight on Saloran Burita RTM on my Freeviews channel 123. Or you can also stream the news by surfing RTM's MyClick. Thanks for watching and to all our Christian viewers, we wish you a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays.